Thank you for coming out this evening to hear Dr. Chris Jones. I'm Ann Walton from the Southeast Iowa Sierra Club, along with the Sustainable Living um, Coalition, SILT, uh, JFAN, and Radiant Dairy. Uh, we appreciate you coming here tonight to hear Chris's talk on water quality. Now, I think what you'll find tonight is that, that the science is clear on where we are in the state of Iowa in regards to water quality. We know we have 700 impaired waterways. The other waterways are of some question, depending on what it is you're measuring and what you're talking about in terms of pollutants. We also have one of the most powerful pieces of legislation that was ever created in this country, which is the Clean Water Act, along with the Clean Air Act as well, created in the 1970s. They're very powerful tools if you use them for what they've been intended for. But when, that, when the rubber hits the road, and it's up to the state to ensure that we're in compliance with the Clean Water Act, politics enters into the picture there have become layers of complexity on top of the science itself. So Chris is a scientist, he's a hydrologist, he's a chemist. Uh, he's been working for the University of Iowa since 2015. It's pretty clear what he's seeing and he'll share some of that science with you tonight. What happens after you bring science to the forefront and it's on a collision path with a very important industry, or industries I should say, in the state, what happens to the science, and what happens to good common sense, and also what happens to everybody's right to clean water and clean air. We're going to focus just on the water part tonight. So I'm very pleased to be able to introduce Dr. Chris Jones. Um, we had the, the really great honor of bringing him to our the Sierra Club's quarterly meeting last summer, and he made, not to make a pun, but a very big splash. I know that I just made that up right now. That was pretty good. <laughs> but I think it was the first um, of many uh, eye openings for our community to re engage in this topic of water quality. And, and now, with Chris's departure under uh, political uh, pressure, I would say, I think that's fair to say, but we'll let Chris speak to his own circumstances. It's kind of ramped up the need for communities to get engaged in their own water quality issues. So we'll talk a little bit more about that tonight. Before Chris starts with his presentation, I'd like to bring Diane Rosenberg up, and she's going to, to give up a very personal tribute to Chris. So thank you. This is such a great turnout. It's so good to see so many people here from Des Moines, and I know someone from Lee County, and you bring them on. <laughs> so um, I work with Jay Finn, as many of you know, Jefferson County Farmers and Neighbors. Um, we work to protect Jefferson County from CAFOs, and we support traditional, independent, small-scale livestock, livestock production. So I'm coming from a CAFO perspective here tonight. Um, and I can tell you from firsthand experience working with communities, that CAFOs ruin the quality of life of people, they ruin the public health, and they desecrate our public waterways. And I've been a fan of Chris's for many years. He came here about five years ago to have a talk right here. And, um, and over the years, I've really learned a lot from reading his work and listening to his presentations. And I want to share um, a few things why I particularly appreciate um, his work and why I feel like it's really important. Um, first, Chris gets the whole picture, okay? He gets the corn, the soy, the CAFOs, the drainage districts, the stream engineering, the whole shebang. He gets that whole picture and he puts it all together so that it all makes sense. The, uh, this problem is not coming from any one area. It's coming from a lot of different areas. And he makes that really clear with his work. Um, and he's not afraid to speak out, um, and he's done this over and over, and, um, and I'll tell you, big ag is really powerful, it's a big powerful force, and it takes a lot of courage to speak out and, and, and stand up to it, stand up to that big monolithic energy that it is. 
But Chris did it anyway, anyway and it, unfortunately it cost him his job. Um, but with the Swine Republic and with his new Substack blog, um, he's still speaking out. And that takes a lot of guts. Um, as Anne said, he's a, a, a research engineer, a hydrologist, chemist. Um, he's a scientist, and all of his work is based on data. And, you know, the industry might not like the data. They certainly don't seem to like the data. Um, but they can't really argue with the data. And, you know, they might try to hide or ignore the data, like they're doing with the water sensor program. But the data is the data, and that's for us to use, you know, in our advocacy work. Um, in order to fix a problem, you really have to understand all the facets of the problem. You need to understand it. And Chris excels in, in writing about Iowa's water quality in very engaging ways that makes what's going on in the state very accessible to all of us. And that's really important. And it's because of his credibility that he's driving a serious dialogue about Iowa's water quality crisis. And we need to all pay attention. Iowans across the state, we all need to pay attention to what he says. And we need to find a way to work together um, to find grassroots ways to fix this. Because obviously, the legislature is not doing that. And they are actually ignoring, too many legislators are ignoring the actual facts that are right in front of their face. And they are failing us. They are failing Iowa. And, and it's, it is just such a disservice for all of us. Um, our water quality issues, our public health issues, their environmental justice issues, their community rights issues, and that's us. That's all of us. So I'm really grateful for the work that Chris Jones does and giving us the information that we need so we as a, as a state, as individuals, as the people, can take this to the next level. Because the legislature is not going to do it on its own. We're going to have to be part of this. And, um, and I really want to thank you for all your work, everything that you've done over the years. And I want to thank you for coming here to Fairfield and making this one of your very first book tour stops. Well, very good. <laughs> Those were very kind and generous remarks and probably more than what I deserve. And so, you know, I hear people say, well, he speaks out. And I'd say, well, I don't think I really do that. I just speak, right? And so... <laughs> Uh, there's just not enough of that in, um, you know, my line of work where we just want to spend our time doing our uh, projects and doing our science and, and writing our papers and this sort of thing. And uh, we view this, too many of us, I think, view this problem as a toy and it's just to play with and without recognizing that what we're really doing here is what we really should be doing is working towards the common good and the common good is a better water for all of us here in the state of Iowa. And so I think all the time, you know, I, I'm 62 years old. I've lived most of my life in Iowa. The water has been bad the entire time, okay? <laughs> my entire life. And so something's really wrong here. And unless people speak, okay, you don't have to speak out. You just have to speak to, to affect change. And so that's what I'm trying to do. And I uh, and brought some slides here to help me do that tonight. And so I don't know if this light would turn down. And so yes, I as of uh, three or four hours ago, I am not working at the University of Iowa anymore. I, uh, today was my last day. Uh, and so um, uh, I, my website is still there. My blogs are not there now, which is fine. That's what I wanted. And but if you're interested in any of my old um, presentations, uh, the slides are still up there. These here tonight will not be there. Um, and so what I did there at the university is I managed uh, the state's um, network of water quality sensors that were deployed uh, at about 70 sites all across the state. This is one of the sites. This is in Johnson County. I think it's in Clear Creek. We had two staff people that work as field field um, 
people that um, operate and maintain the system, and you can see them standing there. And so the water quality sensor network was supported by the Iowa Water Quality Information System. That's still live. It shows where all the sites are. You can click on a site and see what the water quality is right now. Okay. And so all these sensors are in the water. They're measuring water quality continuously. The data streams into the university and is posted up here on this site. This is really an excellent tool. It's still going. Uh, probably will still be operational for another six months at least. And so if you haven't visited this, I really encourage you to do this. I could do a whole presentation just on this website. There's so much to learn about Iowa and water quality and weather and land use and all sorts of things by going to this site. So you can see here, you click on one of the sites, and just for example, it delineates the watershed area that's draining to the site. Just a really fantastic tool. And so when I talk about Iowa uh, and <coughs> Iowa streams to people, um, I can tell that one of the issues that we have is people just do not understand what our streams should be like, right? And so when we do our work, we always are looking for what we call reference streams, ones that are undisturbed, so we can compare what we have to an undisturbed stream, you know, and that informs us, right? It tells us how much things have changed. A big problem with us is we have no reference streams, okay? All our streams are so disturbed that we have to go to other states to find what a reference stream should look like. Before Europeans got to Iowa, we know our prairie streams were these shallow systems, okay, shallow streams. They had perennial vegetation on the stream banks. Uh, sand and gravel uh, was the substrate of the stream. The um, water table was very close to the surface. And then we had clean water species like smallmouth bass and pumpkin seed sunfish. And then the generalist uh, species of channel catfish uh, made up the, uh, dominated the fisheries of these streams. And then we got here, and of course, we plowed up the prairie, right? Uh, in the 1830s and 1840s, uh, farmers got their hands on the John Deere steel plow, and we turned over the prairie. And the other thing we uh, did was we drained the landscape. We lowered the water table four, four feet, and so it's very wet in Iowa. Our soils retain water, um, and so to optimize these um, farms for crop production, we need to dry them out. And so we lowered the water table. We did that by constructing these trapezoidal ditches. You can see in the upper left there. And then the, the uh, guys laying the clay tiles there in Boone County uh, in the lower left. And so that lowered the water table and drained these fields as we see in the drainage district, drainage ditches there on the right. And so this was especially true in areas north of Interstate 80. Uh, although we do have a fair amount of tile drainage down here and in other places of southern and western Iowa. The other big thing we did is we straightened the streams to square them up for farming. And so uh, as we did that, we used the spoils to levy them uh, to prevent flooding onto the fields. And so this is Walnut Creek in Jasper County. And so that red line is the stream now. The green line is the stream in the 1930s. So you can see we have the distance there from 1,000 meters to 500 meters. But the vertical drop from point A at the top to point B at the bottom is the same. That hasn't changed. And so the vertical drop is the same, but the linear distance has been halved. So that means we've energized that water, right? And when we did that, it caused the streams to erode downward. And so we see here uh, that uh, diagram on the right. Most of our streams in Iowa are in that stage four uh, of degradation, of hydrological degradation, from them eroding downward. And so now when you drive across the countryside, you see these streams and they're down in these canyons, right? And the, we have a dirt line canyon, all right, that's exposed. All that material, or about the first six feet of that material in the river valleys was all deposited there since settlement. And so it's what we call unconsolidated. It's very vulnerable to erosion. And so the streams are so flashy because we don't have any vegetation on the landscape for seven months out of the year. The streams come up really fast. They access that vulnerable material. It erodes away. 
And so consequently, our streams are always muddy, even when it's not raining. <clears throat> and so now our streams look like this. They're down in these canyons, as I said. Instead of perennial plants on the riverbanks, we have the annual uh, crops of corn and soybean. We have the tile drainage. The water table is much, much deeper now. Um, the bottom, the sand and the gravel substrate has been silted in. And now we have the pollution tolerant species, the carp, bullhead, and we still have the generalists, the channel catfish. And so our desirable native species that evolved in these clear water systems, okay, they're sight feeders, right? They catch their prey by seeing it and capturing it and eating it. And so when all our streams are turbid and muddy, the sight feeders can't uh, find their prey. And so over a period of decades, we get this exchange of species. And so we see the clean water native species go away and get replaced by the pollution tolerant species. And so, you know, you see we have straightened thousands, straightened thousands of miles of streams here in Iowa. And so that on the right there is um, uh, South Skunk River, southeast of Ames, and you can see long stretches of straight streams. This is especially true in western Iowa and streams flowing to the Missouri River. And so we have a river like the Boyer River that's 200 miles long. It's been straightened its entire length. And so none of our native species evolved to live in this hydrological condition. Okay. And so you know, as our streams sort of have degraded, our farms now look clean, right? You, know, you drive across the countryside, and all our farms look like this. Uh, corn and soybean, no weeds, the GMO crops, there's no weeds out there. We have 25 million hogs in Iowa. You could drive across Iowa and never see a hog, right? Um, we have 25 million of them, but you never see them because they're in these buildings up on the horizon. And then we have the ethanol industry. And so it all looks clean on the land, but of course it doesn't look clean in the water. And so the consequences of this, of course, have been erosion. Um, and we see here uh, soil erosion is still terrible. And we hear the industry talk about how much erosion has improved, but we're still the worst state in the United States for soil erosion. And so we had very substantial improvements in uh, erosion between about 1985 and 1995 after conservation compliance in the Farm Bill required farmers to adopt uh, soil conservation plans if they're farming on highly erodible land. But we really haven't seen many improvements since the mid-90s. Um, the nutrient pollution, of course, is what we talk about quite a lot with the nitrogen and phosphorus. And of course, this impairs our lakes and, and our rivers and our drinking water supplies. And when we look at Iowa, Iowa's contribution to this, uh, to the larger basins downstream from us, um, we contribute 55% of the nitrate to the Missouri River. And that's coming from only 3.3% of the land in the Missouri River Basin. So we have 3.3% of the land, we contribute 55% of the nitrate. In the upper Mississippi, uh, this is the area draining uh, to the Mississippi above St. Louis, uh, not including the Missouri. Uh, we have 21% of the land, we contribute 45% of the nitrate, and then um, down at the bottom, at the Gulf of Mexico, uh, we have 4.5% of the land, we contribute 29% of the nitrate, and 15% of the phosphorus. So, I mean, we are a big contributor at the continental scale, okay, at the continental scale, we are uh, impairing water. But we have problems here at home, and we know that. And so um, we know since the year 2000, we've had 7,000 uh, private wells that have been contaminated with nitrate above the safe drinking water limit. Uh, public water supplies like we have here in Fairfield and, and other communities, there's about 900 of them in Iowa. Uh, one third of them have been deemed vulnerable to nitrate contamination by DNR. Uh, 60 of them are actually removing nitrate, and then about 25% of Iowans a drink water that's been treated for nitrate reduction. And in the news recently, you might have seen, or maybe you did, but Randy, Fre Randy Feenstra, a District 4 congressman, sort of crowing about how Sioux Center was on this new rural water system. 
up in Northwest Iowa, uh, Lewis and Clark Rural Water, and how this was a great achievement for the people up there. But the thing he didn't say in any of this was Sioux Center's uh, wells have been contaminated with nitrate. And so the city had to hook up to this Lewis and Clark um, water system. Well, guess what? I mean, we pay for that, right? All of us pay for that. For Sioux Center, a relatively um, uh, prosperous community, uh, you know, their water's been contaminated, and so they have to hook up to rural water, and, you know, that's a program funded through USDA. And so I always say here, what we have is a problem of scale, okay? It's not so much what any individual farmer is doing. We have a problem of scale, and Steve and I were talking about this on the way down here. And so Washington County, we hear all the time, okay, uh, and I know this isn't Washington County, but you're close to it. Washington County um, is like conservation central, right? When you hear idols and, and other people talk, uh, oh, there's all these cover crops in Washington County. 13% or 15% of the land is in cover crops. But the water's still terrible. Lake Darling's still terrible. Uh, the streams are still terrible. And so, you know, we have 13% of the land in cover crops, but there's 500,000 hogs in Washington County, okay? And so why would we think having 13% of the land in cover crops is going to somehow counteract the fact that 500,000 hogs are excreting their waste there? You know, it doesn't make sense. And that's what I mean when we talk, when we, I say we have a problem of scale. And so we have 70% of our land in corn and soy, but we have 11,000 square miles of our land that's used for ethanol production. And so an area of land it's equivalent to 20 counties, okay? 20% of our state is used to grow corn for ethanol. 25 million hogs uh, still have a fairly healthy beef industry with 4 million cattle. We're the number one egg state. We have 80 million chickens, 5 million turkeys, 4 million broilers, and 220,000 dairy cows. And so this is what I mean. Can we get the water quality objectives that we want when we're farming at this scale? And I would say we cannot. And so the other thing that's a big travesty here is we have so little public land. And so we only have about 2% of our state's land that's in the public hands. That's the second worst in the country. More than half of that is in road easements. So really, only about 1% of our land is uh, in road easements. And so here we see the amount of public land that we have compared to the states that border us. To me, this is just a huge tragedy. This angers me more than the water quality. The fact that we have so little public land, so few parks, uh, you know, and this is a huge quality of life issue. And so, like I say, if you uh, visited the parks during the COVID, right, uh, people were outside, that's what they wanted to do. You could not get a campsite in, the, in a park in Iowa during COVID. And it's just a travesty that we don't have more public land uh, that we can use. And so let's talk about what it costs to clean this up. Um, and so this slide was maybe about a month ago, so maybe these are a little off. But um, to buy a pound of nitrogen today, nitrogen fertilizer costs 86 cents for a farmer to buy a pound of nitrogen and so we have the Iowa Nutrient Reduction Strategy, the state's uh, showcase water quality policy. It outlines the different practices that are eligible for cost share to mitigate that nitrogen pollution. Those practices, uh, to use them, it costs between two and ten dollars a pound to remove the nitrogen or trap it before it gets into the stream. Okay, so 86 cents a pound to buy it, an average of six dollars to keep it out of the stream. How is this going to work, right? It just does not add up. And so when farmers have license to buy however much they want and then ask the taxpayer to pay it clean, to clean it up, I just think that's a morally bankrupt policy. And so we look at our average uh, statewide stream load, load of nitrogen. It's about 600 million pounds a year. Um, and so the nutrient strategy has an objective of 45% reduction. A 45% reduction from 600 million is 270 million. 
And so the, for $2 to $10 a pound to remove it, that's going to be $540 million to $2.7 billion per year. Where are we going to get that? Okay, we all want uh, roads and schools and all these other things, right? Libraries. Uh, the entire budget for the University of Iowa, okay, thousands of employees is only $220 million. And so, you know, how are we going to get this? The average person on the street does not want to get out their checkbook and write a check for their share of this. So this has got to come from the farmer. It's just got to if we're going to address this. And so at the same time we're implementing, implementing new practices, we're also doing things to make the problem worse. And one of the main things is new drain tile. And so we know the tiles are the primary delivery mechanism for nitrate from farm fields to the stream network. We have two million miles, over two million miles of tile in Iowa right now. And you can see where it is mostly in that map at the top there. And so we know uh, that farmers, um, this is 2016 uh, data here. In 2016, they're spending about $70 million a year on new tile. That's probably about $100 million now with inflation. And so at the same time we're trying to implement practices, we're spending money hand over fist to make the problem worse. And so we look at uh, the Middle Cedar watershed. And so there's 56 watersheds in Iowa we classify as what we call Huck 8 watershed. <coughs> Middle Cedar's one of them, so it's 156th of Iowa. And from aerial imagery uh, we've done at the University of Iowa, we know that farmers are putting in 1,200 miles of new tile every year, okay? So, you know, how are we going to get our arms around this? And so how do we overcome these structural drivers to bad quality, uh, bad water quality? And so, um, you know, Matt Liebman, his friend of mine, recent re recently retired from Iowa State, and he spent his career studying these extended rotations where we're growing not just corn and soybean, but uh, corn, soybean, oats, and two years of alfalfa. And he looks at that compared to corn and soybean. We use 91% less nitrogen fertilizer in that extended rotation, 97% less herbicide. And even with cutting herbicide use that much, the weed biomass was similar in the two systems. Uh, soybean health is better, uh, soil health is better in the extended rotation. Tile nitrate was 57% lower. So here we've already gone way past the objective of the nutrient reduction strategy. The objective of the nutrient reduction strategy is 45%, right? Given farmers cost share to implement practices like bioreactors and saturated buffers. Here we get 57% uh, lower and the taxpayer has paid nothing, okay, zero dollars. And we've already gotten to that objective. Soil erosion was 50% lower in the extended rotation. Fossil fuel use, uh, greenhouse gas uh, component there, 60% lower. And the net returns to the farmer were similar. So the revenue was a little lower, but also the input costs were much lower. And so why don't we do this, okay? <coughs> We know that it would give us the environmental outcomes that we want, and we know farmers could make similar dollars doing this. Well, this is work, right, to manage this extended rotation. It's work. It takes more hours. It's more difficult to manage. And, you know, a lot of people don't realize that just growing corn and soybean in Iowa now is pretty easy, okay? It's pretty easy. Growing GMO crops with corn and soybean it's like an eight week out of the year job for a lot of farmers, okay? And so farmers joke about this amongst themselves. You know, my rotation is corn beans in Miami. Or, you know, two weeks spraying, or two weeks planting, two weeks spraying, two weeks harvesting, go to Florida or Scottsdale. And so that's fine. I mean, if all, if any of us were in that same sort of uh, situation, we might make the very same decision. We're all human beings. I say, you know, it's not that farmers are evil, it's that they're human beings and they're making decisions based on their own self-interest. It's all good. What I say is, why should we be indemnifying that? 
okay, through these subsidy programs and other uh, sorts of things that funnel uh, public money to farmers. And so this is just something that is really bothersome to me. And so um, the other big thing is ethanol. And I think we need to get rid of ethanol. And, uh, and when we look at land prices in Iowa, okay, that uh, orange line is the land price, the blue line is the amount of ethanol produced in this country. Okay, land prices have increased in lockstep with ethanol production, and so we've created land wealth for a few people here in Iowa, right? Well, what we've done is we've effectively made the occupation off limits to young people that might come in and want to do some imaginative things, you know, something other than corn and soybean, they can't get the land, right? The land is so expensive because we've created this guaranteed market for corn. And so if you own land uh, in northern Iowa, for example, that's you know, valued at $25,000 per acre, and you have a guaranteed market for your corn, and you know it's only going to take you six or eight weeks out of the year to grow that corn, what are you going to do? Of course you're going to grow corn, right? We would, almost all of us would make that decision. And so we need policy that alters that framework, okay? And so we created this monstrous behemoth with the ethanol industry, right? With policy. It's there because of policy. We ought to be able to, you know, do the opposite, right? We ought to be able to create policy that incentivizes production of other things that don't have the environmental outcomes that we don't want. And so the calories from corn used to produce fuel ethanol, think about this, it exceeds the caloric requirements of the entire U.S. population. <laughs> it's insane. And it creates perversity in U.S. Ag agriculture. And so we look, I mean, everybody's heard of Ogallala Aquifer, maybe not everybody, but we grow corn in western Kansas now, right? In western Nebraska, uh, where you get 15 inches of rain, and there's ethanol plants out there taking that corn and using it to produce ethanol, and we're sucking the Ogallala Aquifer dry. It takes 6,000 years to re naturally replenish it to grow corn for ethanol that we're going to use for a few decades. How does that make sense? And everybody's heard of the Colorado River, I presume, and all this uh, talk about how Los Angeles and Phoenix and Las Vegas are all going to run out of water. Um, half of the Colorado River is used to irrigate alfalfa. Half of it. Well, alfalfa is a crop, a crop we could grow here without irrigation, right? Well, why don't we grow it? Because we're growing corn for ethanol. And so the fact that we have these policies associated with the renewable fuel standard creates perversity throughout our agricultural system in the country. And so we have this paper, a uh, recent paper by these guys at the University of Wisconsin and elsewhere. They took a lot of heat for this. Uh, in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, um, they show that the renewable fuel standard increased corn acres 9%, uh, crop area 2.5%. Two, two Increased fertilizer use three to eight percent, degraded water quality three to five percent, and increased greenhouse gas emissions twenty four percent. So why are we doing this? You know, this is a system that we indemnify with our tax dollars. And you know, where is the common good here? I ask you, where is the common good? Sure, there's a you know seven thousand between three and seven thousand jobs here in Iowa, but associated with this industry. But again, we created this with policy. We ought to be able to address this with policy. And that includes the three to 7,000 jobs. And so these 11,000 square miles that we use for ethanol, what else could we do on that land? So that's 7 million acres. So let's just talk about that. Uh, we could take 150,000 of those 7 million acres. This is just I. We could grow enough canned sweet corn for every person in the United States. Um, we could take 1.1 million of those acres and grow enough dried beans for every person in the U.S. Um, 
Take 360,000 of those acres, grow enough potatoes for every person in this country. Uh, we could take 220,000 of those acres and grow enough apples for every person in the United States. Iowa used to be the top apple producing state, believe it or not. Uh, 140,000 of those acres, we could grow enough onions for every person in the United States. 37,000 acres, enough cherries for everybody. Um, 26,000 acres, grow enough walnuts for everybody. And after all of that, we still have 5 million acres left. Okay? And this is just Iowa. And so here's the end. Uh, this map was, when I made this map four or five years ago, I could never imagine this was the most consequential thing I'd ever do. But... Um, so what I did is I looked at all of our 56 Huck 8 watersheds in Iowa. I looked at the livestock populations. I looked at literature values for their waste. I converted it to a human equivalent. And so this is the effective population that's living in all our 56 uh, Huck 8 watersheds in Iowa. So we have the fecal waste here that's equivalent to about 170 million people. Okay? And so can we achieve our water quality objectives when we're producing at this scale. Okay, this is the discussion we refuse to have. And I would say we can't. And so um, that's the end there, and there's my book. And so I'll be happy to talk to you about any of this stuff. talking about the cost of nitrate reduction, that was just with biological methods, not the nitrate reduction by the Des Moines Water Department. That's correct. That's on-farm practices to uh, trap the nitrogen and keep it from out of the streams. What happened in Des Moines? Wasn't there a terrible thing where the guy got fired for trying to... Well, he died. He Moines? died. That was a couple of years ago. Yeah. Right? And so Des Moines, uh, and I used to work at the Des Moines Water Works, um, so they've been removing nitrate from their source waters, which is the Des Moines and Raccoon River and then some shallow wells since 1993, okay? And so um, there never was any progress in solving this, and then the guy you're talking about is Bill Stowe, and um, he... Um, became the uh, general manager and along with some cooperation from the mayor and others in Des Moines sued three upstream counties, um, the drainage districts in the upstream counties, essentially wanting the drainage districts to be permitted uh, dischargers under the Clean Water Act. And of course they lost and Stowe died and everything's the same. <laughs> Most of the legislators in Iowa own CAFOs? Oh, I wouldn't say most, but I think about 20 to 25 percent of our legislature is comprised of people that call themselves farmers. Yes? Is there interest from the medical profession about the health concerns with things like high nitrates in the water? So um, it's interesting that uh, there was a news story uh, that was pretty widely reported here a few weeks ago that Iowa now has the second highest cancer rate in the United States. And so, you know, can we uh, say that that's from, you know, farm pollution or farm chemicals? I mean, no, we can't say that, but um, clearly we have um, land use here that would, you know, involve a large amount of chemical use. And so... Um, we've known for a long time, this is sort of uh, bewildering to me, um, the nitrate standard in drinking water is 10, okay, 10 parts per million of, as nitrogen. But we've known for a long time that levels below that uh, really could have health consequences for adults. And so we've seen literature from Europe and from uh, here in the U.S., Wisconsin, and other places showing nitrate levels as low as about three uh, parts per million, three milligrams per liter, um, um, present an increased cancer risk, colorectal cancer and bladder cancer, especially in women. But yet we still look at that 10 as the, you know, 
the standard. And so I was telling somebody the other day, and maybe it was in one of these interviews I did. When I worked at the Waterworks, you know, if we were sending out 9.9 .9 out to the city, is we're good, right? <laughs> we're meeting the standard. And so there's people in Iowa that never drink water below five part per million of nitrate. Um, that's quite uh, quite common. Yes, sir. Well, see, the, clean, the ethanol was supposed to have helped with cleaner air as we were using less oil. Correct? So the oxygenated additives to the fuel was supposed to reduce carbon monoxide emissions and some other things. And that's true. At the beginning, it did. But now, the emissions that we, uh, the cars have improved, you know, so substantially that that isn't so much an issue anymore. And so we know that in terms of emissions, if we increased or improved the fuel economy standards for cars produced nationwide by one, mil, one mile per gallon, one mile per gallon, it would cancel out all the benefits of fuel ethanol sold in this country. Of course, the other thing is that corn, when they take, when they make ethanol, it has not changed its use. We either export it or feed it to livestock to make cheaper diets. So then we're not using as much soybean meal or as much regular corn. That's very important to make sure that. So it's good to imagine what would happen with the commodity markets if ethanol were to go away. We well, should talk about that. We should definitely talk about that. And so that's why I say ethanol is going to die, right? Yeah. The argument now or the discussion now is, is it going to die in five years or is it going to die in 30 years? <clears throat> well, let's just say it's 30 years. Well, 30 years ago was 1993, and I remember 1993 very clearly, right? And so 30 <laughs> years into the future is not that long. And so we need to be talking now. What sort of land use do we want to see on these 7 million acres? And yes, how it's going to affect the rest of the commodity markets is an important discussion, and we need to talk about that. And there's no, there's no market for the oats. We can't raise good oats in this part of the state because of the high humidity. It's the reason we don't raise wheat. The other thing is, on alfalfa and oats, where's the market? Also, you'll have to have separate for to raise alfalfa, then you've got to invest in separate, much more expensive equipment for two operate, two, three different crops, and then you've got to have more acres to justify the cost of that high price equipment. There is no doubt that farmers will have to recapitalize if we change the other crops. But there is no doubt about that. And so this is why I say we need policy. I'm not advocating that farmers become less prosperous. We need to figure out policy for farmers to remain prosperous and for us to get the environmental outcomes that we want. And so I'm not one for throwing farmers to the wolves on this. That's why we need to discuss what are we going to do with these 7 million acres and how can we... Um, transition farmers to different production systems that allows them to remain prosperous and give us the environmental outcomes that we want. Yes. What you're talking about is the farm bill. And so what I'm going to give you is a magic wand to change the farm bill, which is up for reauthorization this year. How are you going to use that magic wand? How would you change the farm bill this year? Well, uh, you know, I haven't given that much detailed thought, to be honest, but I think we need to incentivize production of alternative crops. And so I recognize that this is a fantastic place to grow corn. We know that. There's no place on earth that's better for growing corn here. But again, what are our objectives? So the Farm Bureau, the Farm Bill, I would ask you, is the Farm Bureau designed to around human nutrition and environmental outcomes, or is it designed for commerce? The latter. And I would say it's designed for commerce. And so policy here, whether it's a farm bill or anything else, we need to think of policy in the context of human nutrition and environmental outcomes. Thank you.
So firstly, so she asks, are areas sort of downstream, are the health con consequences more severe than they are upstream, I guess, in a general way? Well, and and if the water, if it flows down, you expect it to get worse and worse because you So we tend to, so firstly, about 31% of our state flows to the Missouri River and about 69% to the upper Mississippi. And so the part flowing to the Missouri is flowing from northeast to southwest. The part flowing to the Mississippi is flowing from northwest to southeast. And so do the downstream uh, communities have higher um, incidences of cancer or whatever disease we might think of? And, you know, I'm not an authority on this sort of thing. I will tell you in terms of nitrate, the highest concentrations tend to be at the top of the watershed, okay? And so when we think of what is at the headwaters of the watershed, well, that's where the farms are, that's where the tiles are coming in, and so that's the highest concentration of nitrogen. Things in nature like nitrogen, right? And so when we have nitrogen and phosphorus in our streams, species will take advantage of that and consume it, okay? And so that being algae that we see a lot of and the cyanobacteria. And so we see these, oftentimes, these nutrient concentrations decline as we move downstream. In general, the turbidity, the turb... So land use, but the top of the watersheds tend to have the highest concentration of farm. And by the top... I don't necessarily mean north or the top of the state. I mean the headwaters of the watershed. And so then as the watersheds, water proceeds down from the top, the nutrients get consumed by uh, various species. Now, muddiness and turbidity always tends to be worse at the bottom of the watershed than it is at the top of the watershed. And so a lot of contaminants do move with soil particles. And so stuff will attach very tenaciously to soil particles. So you might think then muddier water is worse for health consequences than the, the clear water. And so that's real intuitive. But as far, I don't have any knowledge about uh, the geo, geographical variation of illness or cancer or anything like that. And so, you know, obviously there's lots of extenuating uh, factors here, rates of smoking and um, access to medical care and so forth. And, you know, Lee County, very rural, um, sort of economically distressed, right? And so it would um, be intuitive that, you know, rates of illness there might be worse. Chris, I, do you need a chair? No, 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 no. Okay, you okay. good. This lady in the back here, the picture on, yeah. So yes, and my colleague Dave Swertney uh, studies this, and this is going to be a big issue without a doubt. What was the question? The forever chemicals. And so that's what we call the PFAS, and so they're in the firefighting foam, right, and they're in plastics. And so we're finding this everywhere at very low levels, and they seem to have health consequences at very low concentrations. And so this is going to be a huge issue, there is no doubt. And so it's... It's in Iowa waters, yes. Yes, sir. Actually, um, question Rose. First of all, some of us in this room did Iowa water quality testing back in the aughts, early, early 2000s, and it was absolutely hopeless. I mean, just in Jefferson County alone, if you wanted to go out to various collection points, you know, just waterways, watersheds in the area, uh, I mean, we would do that. It's consistent sampling of a kind that gave you irrefutable science was impossible to come by without fielding the National Guard and spending $9,000 a month on testing equipment. You just couldn't do it. So first of all, thank you so much for putting together that sensor system. I mean, you gave us a picture that would have been impossible to do in any other way. Uh, secondly, yeah. Thank you.
you're delineating so nicely what Iowa could look like and what the food supply could be like if we just changed our priorities on how we use this land. So I like to say, you know, people have this fantasy of Iowa returning to tall grass prairie, right, and the wetlands. And so, you know, that's not, you know, a realistic outcome here. This is a great place to grow stuff, and so we should do that. We should do that here. We can grow stuff here more sustainably than we can grow it in, say, eastern Colorado, right? <laughs> <laughs> that makes more, no sense. And so we should do that here. And so let's make the best of the resources that we have, right? Again, let's design a system for nutrition and environmental outcomes. <clears throat> Go ahead. Okay. I have three different questions. You choose what order you want to answer them in. <laughs> One of the questions is, um, what happened at the University of Iowa? What were the forces that led you to you know, give up your position there? That's one question. Two is, um, how best to fight these forces that are preventing your kind of information from having an effect and changing laws and things? And three, are you aware of the recent California, uh, Supreme Court supported <laughs> California in uh, requiring that pigs have enough room to lie down and turn around, which of course Iowa was fighting, and, and now they're saying, well, it's going to make pigs, you know, bacon costs more and all that. If, I, if you could address, if that's going to help us at all. So, you know, I'm not an attorney, and so I don't know the legal merits of the California case. The thing that's mysterious to me all the time is how farmers say, well, we're price takers, we're not price makers, right? Mm -hmm. What well, here, huh? What does that mean? Well, it means they just, they produce and they have to take what price is there. They don't set the price. Oh. And so, like the maker of this chair, for instance, that company decides what it's worth and what their profit margin needs to be, and then they charge that. Yeah. Farmers can't do that. So we have commodity markets where the prices are set, and then farmers have to figure out how to make money, you know, within that price structure. Commodity markets being the... the um... Corn, soybean... Pork, and everything the, we who do. Who sets the prices? Chicago Board of Trade, generally. Is this like a Wall Street thing? Or? Yeah. Oh. And so, so farmers uh, talk all the time how they're price takers and not price makers. And then we have this colossal, okay, specialty market open up in California, which is bound to be an economic opportunity for somebody, right? And they, all they do is complain about this. And I just do not understand it. I don't get it. And so whether or not California, you know, can, what's the legal merit of them requiring, you know, these uh, various production systems, I don't know. But it's mysterious to me why there aren't a bunch of farmers out there saying, oh my God, look at this. I can put hogs in a different kind of crate and get double the price for my pork or whatever it might be. Uh, it doesn't make sense to me, and it just tells me that they're just resistant to change. They just don't want change. No, it's a cost to change. But again, it's if you have to... It well, I, I, I'm going to say, it does appear that if more states adopt this, that's fine, but it is going to cause more consolidation with larger operations. Because your small to medium producer, if they've already invested a lot of money in a non-turnaround crate, and a and then to take and turn a farrowing saw into 24 square foot, they ain't gonna be able to get the money good. How many small and medium producers do we have in Iowa? Small the average number of hogs is 4,700. It could be a thousand sow. Huh? It could be a thousand sow unit. Now I, I already know a, a, a one of the largest producers in the United States, in here in Iowa, has just finished adding 5,000 sows to his already in the top 20 because he's ready for this market, but he's able to be able to get into it. And you talk to anybody, they can't afford to change their units. So Why don't they be... get into Neiman Ranch production? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I would ranch. say... But they can't get enough people now. I'm a Neiman Ranch producer. And yeah. They can't get enough people now. That's true. We it's have the enough. capacity. We have the capacity to help farmers transition to these other systems. We have. It. We know we can do it. We incentivize the entire ethanol industry. And so if we identify something that's beneficial to the common good, we should be open to helping farmers transition to that. 
Okay. I am open for that. In the back here. Have you been able to present your spiel to our Secretary of Agriculture? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I know that guy. Uh, he's, he's a nice guy. I mean, I don't know if he's seen any of my slides or not. He might have. I, you know, that is not, so that is not, the Secretary of Agriculture, I don't care who it is, if it's Mike Nag or if it's, you know, Genghis Khan, is not going to be the driver of change here. The driver of change has got to happen at the citizen level, at the grassroots level. Who are we fighting to change? Where do we, how do we make, I mean, if, why is, who's resisting the change? The people are making money from the way things are? So, of course, that we have an entrenched agribusiness system here, right? It's capitalized. So look at, I, I say this often, look at our state and what infrastructure we have that supports the existing production system. The road system, the rail system, all the network of agribusiness retailers, there's 1,100 of them in Iowa. The lock and dam system on the Mississippi River. Um, you know, the chemical industry, the fertilizer industry. These are powerful people within our political system, okay? And so, to change requires recapitalization, as this gentleman has pointed out, right? And so people don't want to recapitalize. It costs money. And so that, those are the forces that do not want us to change. Yes, ma'am. Well, I just want to uh, quickly relay a conversation I have with the president of the Corn Growers Association. I was at the state fair, and he usually, the Farmers Union has a table, and he saw that we had uh, we were opposed to the carbon pipeline, so he came and started lecturing me about that, and how could that possibly be, and don't I know that corn is the future, or ethanol is the future of Iowa? <laughs> So, so I would say GM and Ford would say uh, no, but <laughs> yes, Maggie. So I wonder if anybody talks about what the consequences. Yes, we know it's going to be painful to recapitalize and to make all these changes. It's definitely going to be painful and disruptive. What? How painful and disruptive is it going to be if we don't make any changes? We keep on going the way we're going. I think it's going to be ten times worse. It's just a question of how long. I mean, the question is, what kind of Iowa do we want to live in? And like I said, I want to live in a place that has clean lakes, clean rivers, you know, has these uh, amenities that other people take for granted, right? And so, sure, I know this is not the Rocky Mountains of Montana, but nonetheless, I think we have a right to a better natural system than we have. Okay, I think we have that right as citizens. And so, you know, look at Iowa's population. We're, we've been at about 3 million people for decades now, right? We, Iowa was once the 11th most populous state in the United States. Now we're 38. In 1960, Iowa had the more electoral votes than Florida. Okay? Think about that. And so, you know, how do we want the state to look going forward. Do we want young people to come here and want to live, or do we not? And so these are questions that we need to ask ourselves, and the natural environment is an important component of those questions. Yes, sir. Yeah, just to, if that nutrient reduction system was started because of federal regulation, right, the Mississippi in general, they made all the states do stuff. So. That's I a good, just wonder, good what, question, good question. What do the feds think of our volunteer program? So the Chesapeake Bay was the example here. And so farming is regulated in Ches Chesapeake Bay for environmental outcomes. And so EPA wrote what's called a TMDL for the Chesapeake Bay for nitrogen and phosphorus. TMDL is total maximum daily load. Identified all the sources of those pollutants <coughs> in the Chesapeake Bay and then designed regulations to reduce the delivery of those pollutants to the bay. There was about 10 years ago, well, 12 years ago now, there was a big fear here in Iowa and other states that EPA was going to come in and write a TMDL for the Mississippi River. 
And that would have meant regulation of farming here in Iowa, like they're doing in Maryland and Delaware and uh, Pennsylvania and the other states that drain, Virginia, that drain to the Bay. And so um, with Tom Vilsack's um, sort of um, endorsement, the states here in the Corn Belt develop these nutrient reduction strategies as a way to persuade EPA not to ride a TMDL for the Mississippi River. Okay? And so that is the history of these voluntary systems that we have in the Corn Belt states. And so when you hear people say the nutrient set strategy is working, and um, you know you have to remember what the nutrient strategy's objective was. Okay, the objective of the nutrient strategy was to ward off regulation, and in the context of that, the nutrient strategy is working splendidly. Okay. The, stra the nutrient strategy was never, you know, if water got better, fine. But that was not the objective of the nutrient strategy. So how are farms regulated in Maryland? They can only buy so much nitrogen? So their fertilization practices are regulated in terms of rate and timing and these sort of things. And I shouldn't say that I'm authority, an authority on it. I'm not. But so. Yes, sir. So what, what needs to be done to encourage more production of alternative crops? There's some farmers in Iowa who are growing oats for oat leaf, the you know, oat milk manufacturer. Um, it seems like it's a lack of infrastructure. It's, so you know, we the have whole system is designed for corn. So. We need market development. We need infrastructure. We need all of it. And so the remark about oats uh, not growing as well here because of humidity—that's true. Okay, climate change has been a big uh, factor here for oat production, and so. A lot of the oats come from Canada now. And so Cedar Rapids, Quaker Oats is right there. And trains come in from Canada delivering oats. And so, but ask yourself, how much time do the seed giants spend studying oats and yeah. developing hybrids for oats that might grow in a human climate? None, right? There's no money in it. Yeah. And so we need to develop the markets. We need to develop the infrastructure and these other things to make it happen. I talked to, I talked to a farmer who was growing oats, and he called Quaker Oats and said, I have oats, do you want to buy them? And they acted like he was crazy. <laughs> he said, no, we buy them from Canada. Yeah. Well, what do the farmers think? I mean, do they think this is going to go on forever? Or do they have any um, sense of what they're doing and the impact that they're having? Or do they just want to live in Florida and have build a business here? And you know, I can't say what they think in a generalized way. I think, um, you know, I, th I think farmers are making decisions in their own best self-interest, right? And so, like I say, they're not evil. It's their human beings. And so we need policy to incentivize the decisions that we want that will give us the outcomes that we want that contribute to the common good. The problem is we can't agree on what the common good is, right? And so, um, yeah, we're all the choir here, right? And I'm preaching to the choir for the most part. But, you know, there's a lot of people, especially uh, embedded in our politics, that think what we have is the best thing to have. And so we need, uh, uh, you know, sort of this grassroots sort of attitude that this is not the best thing we need, not the best thing to have. Yes, sir, back to that. Yeah. Uh, your sensor system, what does it measure? How does it work and what's going to happen to it? So the nitrate sensors, uh, the sensors measure nitrate. They work through using ultraviolet light and they measure absorbance of nitrate in the streams. And then we also have some sensors that measure turbidity, which is the cloudiness of the water. And from that, we can estimate phosphorus levels. And then we have some sensors doing some other stuff. So what will happen to it? It probably will remain relatively intact for about a year or so. Um, but after that, we don't know. There is some, I learned today, there is some interest from Iowa State in maintaining the sensor network in some capacity uh, beyond the next fiscal year, but all that's kind of preliminary. So. But the legislature took the funding away for it, right? So the legislature took... Um, so we had been getting $370,000 from the Iowa Nutrient Research Center. 
And that money comes from the, the fertilizer tax, okay, um, or the Groundwater Protection Act, which had been funding the Leopold Center. Leopold Center was closed, right, and now the funding goes to the Nutrient Center. That total money, I think, was between about 1.3 and 1.5 million per year. The original intent with the formation of the Nutrient Center was a third of that would come to the University of Iowa. And so that was our money, 370000 Then we had just recently um, agreed, had an agreement with the Nutrient Center um, that that would be increased to 500000 because a lot of the equipment's getting old now. Some of it's 10 years old and it needs to be exchanged out. Um, you know, staff want raises, right? Gas prices increase, all these things. You can't fund a program with stable money. And so, so the Nutrient Center had agreed uh, to increase that to 500000 And that is the amount the legislature took from <clears throat> the Nutrient Center budget and then sent it over to Idols. Okay? Iowa Department of Agriculture and Land Stewardship, what we call IDOLS. And so then the Nutrient Center is faced with the decision, right? Uh, do we keep get, do we give them their five hundred thousand and cut ourselves, you know, by that much, or do we cut, you know, what's going over there? And of course, you know, you know the decision they're going to make. And so that, that money was effectively cut. And so, but we, uh, as I said, there is some talk that the nutrients center in Ames, Matt Helmers is the director, uh, is going to work with the University of Iowa to try to maintain the network in some shape or form. Will it be what it is now? No. And how long will that be? Probably maybe only a year. And so I know that um, my boss, Larry Weber, they're seeking outside funding right now. For them. So you weren't the only person laid off whole department? So the two guys that worked under me, so I wasn't laid off, okay, I wasn't laid off, I wasn't forced to retire, I wasn't forced to quit, and so all this, you know, so my, my blog got thrown into all this whirlwind, right? And so um, now six weeks ago or so, I was told that these two guys in the legislature, um, you know, said, look, you got to do something about his blog or, you know, some funding's going to be at risk. And so that's when I, that's when I, uh, the events surrounding that is why I decided to retire. And so, you know, this is the issue that I have. And so, um, so I'm a public employee, right? And I work at the, at the good graces of our government. And so I understand that. And but what gets me is there's, there's some guys over there that are so thin-skinned that they can't tolerate even what I'm writing. And, um, you know, they got to make threats about that. And, you know, I'm a low guy on the totem pole, okay? I'm, I'm as low as you can get on the whole academic hierarchy at the University of Iowa. And so, you know, it tells you how insecure these guys are about what they're doing. But wasn't it true that it was because they didn't want you having your blog on the, the university platform to go elsewhere? Or wasn't that read on the information on you? It was, but you know what? Iowa State University faculty have blogs. They what? They have blogs. Okay. <laughs> but theirs on the university domain, that's okay. But Mine the, on the university domain was not okay. So can you but tell us? But was content the same? So, a guy at Iowa State University talks about fall tillage, I talk about fall tillage. I throw some flair onto mine, and they don't like it. Can you tell us who really Oh, sure, I'll tell you. It's Dan, uh, Dan Zumba and uh, Tom Shipley, okay? And so, uh, the censors... Uh, did they lie about not doing it? Huh? Did they lie about not doing it? Said they didn't do it? So, so Shipley admitted that the meeting took place. I think Zumba denied that the meeting took place. And so Zumba's son-in-law has a cattle feedlot up at Bloody Run. There's two sensors up there on that stream. So, you know, um, I think reasonable people can reach reasonable conclusions, right? Um, so, yes, ma'am. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, I think somebody told me um, that what I've done here is sort of connect the dots for people, and I think that's probably accurate um, for you know talking to general audiences about this these topics. I think I have connected the dots for people and helped people get a deeper understanding of the issues and whether or not I've changed any minds or not, I think I, I, I don't lay awake at night thinking about that, I'm pretty doubtful, honestly. <laughs> yes, sir. You know, you talked about not getting important issues. Yeah. We can't hear. We can't hear you. Could you stand up? The legislators not wanting to drink water anymore because that's the direction we're going in. Shouldn't they care about that? So the drinking water issue is, you know, um, a really curious one because we talk about Des Moines all the time, right? Des Moines and the nitrate removal facility and Bill Stowe and the lawsuit, we all talk about that. But the real impact here on the drinking water is on rural Iowa, okay? 7,000 private wells in Iowa contaminated with nitrate above the drinking water standard. Those wells are not in Polk County. Okay? <laughs> they're not in Johnson County. They're, well, some of them might be. They're in rural Iowa. And so these are the people that suffer, okay, the consequences of this pollution. The truth is Des Moines has the um, capacity, okay, to deal with this problem on a large scale, okay? Sure, it's a little financially burdensome, but nobody's going to, you know, say it's a tremendous burden on the city. Okay, uh, look and at it's this. it's not. The Des Moines Water Works has never had to borrow money. They issue bonds. I thank Providence that I live in a community that can afford to clean up other people's mess. That's right. So the Water Works has the capacity to do it. But you look at some of these small towns, you know, a lot of our towns, let's face it, they have, they have declining population. The population that is there is elderly. The infrastructure is not good. Where do they find the resources to cope with these sorts of problems? And so to characterize this as a Des Moines versus rural Iowa issue is just dumb, okay? The real impacts are on rural Iowa. Yes, sir. So if you could stop the completely stop the input of extraneous nitrogen and phosphate tomorrow. What is the persistence of these things in surface waters and in groundwater? So, uh, you know, that's a good question. And so we, that's a big research topic is legacy nutrients. And so, you know, especially in some of our deeper groundwater, perhaps in western Iowa, some of the nitrogen down there could have gotten down there 70, 80 years ago, right? And so how long will it take that to sort of work through the system? And I tend to not think as legacy uh, stuff as being as important as a lot of other people. I can't say I'm, you know, a real expert on it, but I do not think the legacy um, nitrogen and phosphorus here would persist for decades. You know, maybe, you know, more a few years, but um, so. Just thinking of those, you know, the 7,000 wells that you, that you described. Are they, yeah, if they're going to be like that for 30 years or 100 years? So most of these farmstead wells are shallow, okay? And so the water's going to turn over in them relatively quickly. And so, you know, could they improve relative, relatively quickly? I think shallow. a lot of them could. Huh? What is shallow? I'd say 80 feet or less. 80? Or less. So, you know, we have wells that are, you know, maybe... 25, right? There shouldn't anybody in Iowa should not be drinking water in a well that's 25 years. No way. Well, Chris. Yes. Um, you wrote a sort of rather cheeky book for a scientist. I mean, if you look at some of the titles of, of these different chapters, Fifty Shades of Brown, Hello Darling, um, you know, Want Clean Water. 
You want to talk a little bit about how a scientist got to writing this and the power behind this because it's very related to your blogs. And so, I'm going to actually ask you to hold it up so everyone okay. can see it. Okay, well, <laughs> yes, and thank you if you want the book and, and if you enjoy it. And so I've done a lot of different jobs in my career. And so I say I've done about everything that I could have done with my um, training. And so I worked in the private sector at a commercial laboratory in Minnesota. I did consulting work for five years. I worked uh, for, at the Des Moines Waterworks for eight years. I worked at the Iowa Soybean Association for five years. And then I spent the last eight at the university. So I've done you know a lot of different things. And in many of these jobs, I had to write uh, materials for the public or for at the Soybean Association for the members. Um, and so I had some experience writing. I always felt like I was sort of an adequate writer. And I always tell people, if you think you're great at writing, you probably aren't. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's not something you can ever be sure that you're good at. But I thought, again, I was adequate. And so, um, and so I think, you know, as scientists, you know, we all write a lot, but we write for each other, okay? And we don't write for general audiences, and I feel like, um, you know, when I write scientific journal articles, if I were to hand that to you, you might make it through about three sentences and say, eh, I'm not reading this, right? And so I felt like to communicate this stuff to general audiences, I had to do it with flair, and I had to do it with some humor, and I had to make it interesting to read. And so that's what I tried to do, right? I tried to consciously do that, and um, I'm a firm believer in a good title is invaluable. And, and so I did think about the titles uh, pretty carefully. And so I don't know. I don't know how you come to do this. I, I think... Um, You know, I would, every time I wrote one, I thought, well, there can't be anything left I can write about. And then I'd read a news story, and I would get upset about it, and I'm, I'm a real stream of consciousness writer, writer, and so I would write these in maybe two or three hours. And, but, you know, I had to have an idea, right? I had to have some inspiration, and uh, fortunately, <laughs> there's a lot of inspiration when it comes to Iowa agriculture, and so all the advocacy organizations all have their communication shops, they're producing uh, materials, and so um, that was fertile ground for me. And so that's kind of how it came about. Now, the book itself has a, a lengthy beginning chapter and a lengthy ending chapter. The beginning chapter is sort of a history of, of farming here and how it evolved. Uh, since European settlement and how that was manifested in our water quality and our environment. And then the final chapter is um, my ideas for how we could change things. And then there's also some essays in there that I tried that were more sort of typical nature writing. And so I'm not sure if that's any good or not, but it was different from what I was writing about in my blog. And so I just wanted people Look, when I read something, I want to be entertained, right? If I'm going to spend 13 hours or whatever it is with a book, I want to be entertained by it. I don't want to doze off to it. And so that's what I tried to do. I tried to, you know, put an entertainment factor in there and then help people learn something. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, and it's from your book, uh, page 71. It says here, Secretary of Interior Julius Krug signs the Pitt Sloan Act as a tribal leader, George Gillette sobs in grief. Can you tell us why he was sobbing? So that, uh, the Pick Sloan Act is what um, impounded the Missouri River, okay? Impounded. So we created the reservoirs on the Missouri River. And so the Missouri River is entirely impounded from Sioux City up to, um, you know, central Montana, What's with these huge impounded? lakes. So we built dams build huge dams and then we formed these big lakes and then there were hydroelectric power uh, at the dams and then we channelized the Missouri from Sioux City on down for barging and to do the uh, lakes and the dams and all that um, required Indians to see more of their land from the reservations and so this George Gillette 
was a was a Native American in South Dakota, and the tribe signed over their land, you know, so we could do this. Did they get paid for that? I think they did get paid, but I don't know uh, what the amounts were. Yes, sir. And Chris, if anyone wants to know the real story of that, which is beyond tragic, uh, read Sarah Vogel's book, The Farmer's Lawyer. Yeah. Yeah. It's absolutely worth it. And that story about what happened those peoples who had been farming on the fertile, you know, uh, floodplain of the Missouri River, and how they had been noted as being exceptionally healthy, and then a generation later, a physician came through to evaluate the tribal health, and it was beyond uh, deplorable. And so, a lot of these things that we've done have extreme consequences particularly to the native people, but if you want a good read, you know it kind of, you know how it came out, right? It's one of those reads where you know it came out and you just say, hold on, what's gonna happen? What's gonna happen? It was probably one of the best reading experiences I've had, but I haven't read this book. Before. The title is The Farmer's Lawyer by Sarah Vogel, and she is the attorney who led the class action suit and got a lot of the foreclosure stuff in the 1980 farm crisis. Mm -hmm. She went on to be the commissioner of agriculture for North Dakota. Okay. You know, is there, what about, the, uh, you said solutions and ideas. What about an idea of, of people who are pushing for the change of show, learning by doing and showing is very important. And so people could take and buy shares in the purchase of, or the rent, but probably be purchased of some farm ground, and then actually doing the production of varied crops with actual cost of accounting for labor and expenses and return on investment, and allowing for the fact there's probably not a market at this time to show that it can be, it would be reduced the, some of this problem. So I think we need more farmers. I think we need more and younger farmers that can bring some imagination to the system. And so I'm for that. I'm for that. And so how do we make that happen? And the biggest obstacle we have to that happening is the price of land. Okay. Well, I said you have to have people willing to invest in a lot of So land. how do we affect the price of land? Okay. How do we affect the price of land? We get rid of the renewable fuel stick. We get rid of what? Renewable, the renewable fuel, fuel stand. Okay. We're going to cut it off. Okay. Yeah. I told that, that's it. So <laughs> thank you for your attention. So I want to leave you because, um, you know, you hear something so, you know, this, this, this man actually is my hero. Um, so I, I'm not a hero. I'm not a hero. <laughs> Just a rock star? Not a hero. Just a rock star, yeah. So we want to help him. He's paying a high price. We, we want to help him. And, and in order to help him, we need to educate ourselves. And so the best way to do that is to read his book. And so what we're going to do is in six weeks, if you sign up back there, we'll let you know when there's going to be a, a, a book club. And we will, um, you know, so please buy, buy the book just to educate yourself. And um, because we, we can't make change without educating ourselves right. and taking responsibility. You can also sign up on yes. Continuing Blonde. And, and that will yes. help support his work. So, yeah. so How do you do that? Yes. So what, so what it's called you riverraccoon.substack.com. And we'll include that in, in the email if you if you um, sign up back there. And what else you can do? Yeah, yeah. And what else you can do is um, we need to plan. We need to organize more events like this across the state. So if you know of people that that are, will will do that, then then <coughs> talk to me. Talk to um, uh, Steve in the back because he's from Ice Cube Rest. Okay. All right. Well, talk to me. And and um, you know because we want to or organize more events across the state like this. 
Um, another thing that you can do besides read the book and come to the second meeting, because in the second meeting that will happen about six weeks, um, Chris will also hope be available. So we, we can continue this conversation because what we really need to do is to create a grassroots movement. And the Farm Bureau is present at meetings all across the state. In you know, in all the supervisors' meetings, the soil and water conservation meetings, we need to have a, a presence as well. But we can't be a presence there of un, 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 as, un, as an uneducated person. So first, please read the book, okay? Um, um, you know, because we, like Chris said, we don't want to be a movement um, against farmers. We want to be a movement that is in support of the environment and farmers as well, because we all live in Iowa. So that's the second thing. Another thing we can do is we can raise money. We need three hundred and seventy thousand uh, dollars, and to to keep the, the these this water sensor pro program going. So that will be a continuing conversation that we can have. So thank you all for coming. And, um, and you'll hear from us, um, we, we just really want to make this a strong and powerful movement of support. Thank you very much.